I think we're now going to open it to uh, an audience Q&A. So if you uh, are interested in asking a question to Mr. Mizuno, if you could raise your hand high, and uh, one of our stewards will uh, pass you a mic. Please wait for the mic, and then uh, if you could stand up and ask the question. So we will take the first question from you, sir. Black sweater, yeah, if you could just wait for the mic. Um, further forward. Thanks. So I'm not um, a professional investor. I just do it regularly, um, like privately. How can I um, see if the ESG certificate is um, trustworthy and what sources to trust? Because I saw there are many rating agencies out there. There are AI, um, Sensefolio is, is rating them um, by AI. Um, how can I trust it's not greenwashed and it is <laughs> something real? Right, that's, uh, that's a good question. Should I just answer it? Yeah, go for it. You know, they, when actually GPF just started investing in a green bond about the, uh, like a nine months ago, and uh, the, uh, now we are the, probably the, one of the biggest investors in a green bond. But when we, we started that initiative, I got the other, you know, the, I was questioned about the other, you know, the issue of greenwashing. And uh, my argument is, you know, that some of the other, the investment may not be as green as you wish, but it's not black. So the, uh, you know, this is the, what we are trying to create, a movement. So the, uh, the, I actually think like uh, we have to bring in more people into that movement. So the, uh, the, if, even if the, some of the ESG rating is actually ended up like ESG washing, the green washing, but still it's better than, you know, non-ESG or totally non-green, right? So uh, I actually advocate like, uh, you know, that we, you don't need to worry too much about it. And uh, European Commission, they are going the opposite way. They are trying to just create the green taxonomy. It's a very, very high standard because they think they don't, shouldn't, they don't think they should allow any green washing. But I always joke that, you know, I mean, there are a lot of sushi washing in Europe. 90% of sushi restaurants, you, you, sushi you eat here is not really sushi. But <laughs> Japanese are inclusive, right? So we accept the, all the different type of sushi. And that's created a global phenomenon, sushi phenomena. Right? So now we need a green phenomena, right? So they don't worry too much about ESG or the green washing. You participate. And, uh, you know, I actually give you one, another uh, interesting the, the, the comments on the AI. You know, GPF worked with the Sony to come up with the AI to monitor our portfolio management. And uh, I'm perfectly convinced what the most of the asset manager or the fund manager doing can be very well replaced by AI. But there's something we don't want the AI to do, which is like an ESG judgment. Because when I started ESG, ESG advocacy, like a lot of people criticize, you know, I'm an investment professional. I shouldn't bring in my personal value or my personal ethics into my portfolio management. That's against my fiduciary duty. But you know, the AI, they will make any judgment unless we tell them we will do it, right? I don't know, because you are too young, but the, any, any of you watch the Terminator? The original one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said this to like Prince Charles the other day. He said, I never watched it, but anyway. <laughs> so the, in the term, first Terminator, you know, the Skynet trying to terminate humanity. And I watched every sequence of the Terminator until the recent one. They never explain why the Skynet trying to terminate humanity. What if ESG investor asked the Skynet to the save the planet? They came up with a solution, which is to terminate the humanity. Because we are the pest. Right? Because we are the ones who are polluting the earth. So the uh, logical conclusion of the AI to save the planet is to terminate humanity. That's not what we want. Right? So the, uh, there's, some, there's something we don't want the AI to decide. We want to make a, dis we want to make a decision. Right? So the green and the ESG, I think, what the humans should do. And the interesting the other observation is, Majority of my team was against my pro uh, proponents, well, uh, the, my you know becoming a proponent of the, uh, the ESG about three years ago. 
But after our Sony's joint pro, you know, project to develop the AI to manage our portfolio, everybody turned into the, uh, the now they're, everybody is so keen on the ESG because they now realize that's the area the human can add value and a human want to keep it a control. Okay. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Okay, good. good. Thank you for that question. Um, if we could take a question from the gentleman in the white shirt. Hello. Thank you for a very interesting speak, speech. I would like to ask you a very simple question. Uh, are you losing to the market? Hmm? Are you losing to the market in your pension fund? I'm sorry, what is it? Is he, are you? Um, are, are you? Losing? Are you? Uh, sorry, are you losing to the market in your pension fund? You said you had some uh, expensive ideas. You said it wasn't important for you to beat the market. Yeah. But are you actually losing to the market? with your policies, and by how much are you losing to the market? Oh, I see, okay. Um, how much we lost to the market? Probably, I don't know, it's probably like a 20 billion. Uh, that's actually the, uh, the, the very interesting question. I mean, um, when you got into the uh, real profession, and you trying to change the system, or trying to change the, the challenge the other, uh, conventional approach of the status quo, you just cannot tell them, I mean, the, what the people value is totally irrelevant, although even if you think that way. So, uh, you know, as I said, I lost the property to the market last year about the 20 billion, but I've been focusing on not to lose the market. You know, you know my point. I have to beat the market to make my, you know, the, to argue uh, it's irrelevant. You know, the, when I lose the, to the market, people think like I'm making excuses, right? So the, I keep beating the market. So the, when I came up with the ESG indices, we designed so carefully not to lose to the original index so that we can claim it's totally irrelevant, right? So, uh, you know, the changing system or changing, changing state of is not easy. You need to the, the continue to perform in the other old matrix to say this matrix totally, you know, the, uh, the oversleep. So uh, we beat the market. I mean, uh, the last year we lost it, but uh, I mean, uh, throughout the, my tenure, I, we beat the market very well. Thank you for that question. Um, if we could take the next question from uh, the women over there. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more on the topic of divestment. Um, so you mentioned how it's impractical because if you step outside from your role, someone will step back in. So there's this collective action problem. But earlier you also mentioned how you'd encourage your daughter to recycle because by one person recycling, there's a ripple effect. Mm. So I'm curious why that same logic doesn't apply to the divestment issue. Um, I'm actually a student from Harvard here on exchange, so uh, my friends were very involved in the divestment campaign there and have genuinely been interested in learning more about it. So um, I'd love to hear your answer to that question, but also um, if divestment isn't practical, then what else would you suggest? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think the divestment is the, um, is, was very effective at the beginning because it's a kind of shocking that some investors start saying, I'm going to divest from fossil fuel because the other, you know, uh, is against our policy. So first of all, when the, uh, some people did it at the beginning, it actually was very, sent a very effective message to the, uh, to the market. But in the public equity market, the other, uh, the shareholders base is so diversified so the, every single, you know, the, the investor's divestment really doesn't affect. But this is something like, um, <clears throat> at a certain point, it may affect, uh, because now the, the dividend yield on oil, gas, oil and gas company is so high, because, you know, that they need to attract the investors by paying a higher dividend. So actually, it worked well. 
But uh, my argument is people like GPIF who owns the quite, you know, the, the biggest share uh, in the market, I think the, we try to stay very annoying shareholder. So we stay in the game and we continue to just irritate them like I did, you know, just arguing they should change. Otherwise, we will continue to, you know, irritate you guys. But uh, I, I think the, uh, everybody can do whatever they want to do. And uh, the other, at some certain point, the other one way is more effective and less effective. And then uh, if the other, everybody starts selling and if you reach certain point, you know, dividend yield become too expensive, and uh, that's actually totally, you know, the, uh, the destroy the business model. I see that's not going to happen because, they, unfortunately, oil and gas company are very, very cash rich, and uh, they, have, they sit on the very, very uh, high the cash balance, so it's very difficult to push that business out of the, uh, the market by selling their stock. So uh, that's, that's my point. Uh, but... You know, the, uh, the, if I were the Cambridge Union, like a Cambridge Endowment, I probably would divest. Because the, 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 the combination of Cambridge and the divestment will create a bit, you know, the more stronger the political statement. Yeah. So, I'm not going to say, like, a, wh whichever way is right, but the other, for us, it doesn't make much sense. But the, for Cambridge, you know, the property does make sense. Thank you for that question. Very interesting. Um, I think we have time for possibly one more question, maybe two if we can squeeze them in. Uh, so the next question, if it could come from uh, the gentleman in the jacket. Uh, yep. Hi, thank you. So something I've been following is like the Bank of Japan's involvement in equity markets locally. And I think more than three quarters of ETFs are owned by the Bank of Japan. So given that we've crossed the bubble, I mean, it's been more than three decades since the bubble burst and your own personal ESG lens, do you think that 300 billion odd corpus should remain in equity markets or should the BOG look at putting that elsewhere? And what other policy recommendations do you have for Japan in general? You mean the other Bank of Japan's the other uh, equity investment, or just that you're asking about that, my own allocation? Um, what would your recommendations be to the Bank of Japan, given your professional expertise? Well, I'm always, you know, the uh, quite, um, you know, the upset or like offended that when the people just talk the other uh, Bank of Japan, like uh, the equity investment, together with the other uh, uh, the GPF the equity investment, because. Four years ago, when I came into my office, 75% of the, our portfolio was in a Japanese government bond. So we made the other, the biggest asset allocation in the history of asset management industry by increasing the, our equity investment into the 50%. And uh, we got a huge criticism by the other general public or like a media, like we are taking too much risk. And also the other, they think the Japanese equity market is supported by public pension and the central bank. But Central banks shouldn't buy equity to begin with. I mean, that's a period. I, I just, I never supported their the idea of central bank buying equity because compared to buying the other, uh, the government bond, the treasury, it never matured, right? So they need to sell it someday. But the, the politically, the, it's politically, it's impossible for the central bank to all of a sudden sell the other equity. Now their holding of equity is becoming about half of our holding. So it's made it even more, more, more impossible for them to sell it in the, in, in, in the market. So uh, I don't agree that the, uh, the central bank should buy. I mean, uh, they, I, I said I support their, you know, the monetary easing to some extent, but the, uh, the buying equity by the central bank is something that shouldn't be done. And um, I mean, from that perspective, I'm very concerned about the Japanese equity market is going to be distorted. And uh, central bank is not going to the, the pay attention to those stewardship of the ESG anyway, because that's, that's, they have the political mandate. So, um, you know, I, I just don't like it, but the other, that's a situation I have to deal with. Um, I think we have time for one final brief question. Um, if we could take a question from uh, the gentleman over there. I uh, just wanted to ask uh, what you think about Masayoshi Son's vision fund hmm? and uh, Masayoshi Son's vision fund and his <laughs> approach to sustainability because it, it d does sound a bit similar. And, uh, personally, I work for ARM, which is a company of the SoftBank Group, 
one of the reasons I decided to go there was exactly because of this sustainability idea that we should be we, should be, we share some responsibility with society. Well, Masayoshi Son's vision is very clear. He thinks like uh, you know they are the AI is something they should bet on, and they make a significant bet, right? And then. Um, it's only Saudi Arabia who can just uh, give the money to the sort of empty team. I mean, the other SoftBank didn't even have an investment team when they raised that money from the Saudi Arabia, right? So the only the combination of the Arab money and the Masayoshi Son's vision created a vision fund. Um, <clears throat> I have very little opinion on their investment, but the, which actually I'm concerned about is now, in a Silicon Valley, a lot of the, uh, the venture capital funds are trying to raise a $10 billion, $50 billion fund, saying, you know, that now that because of the vision fund, they need to protect their investment. But, you know, the negative consequence of that competition is it will keep the company private longer. So I was approached by the Sequoia Capital, that's the other fund, who never introduced, you know, the invited new investor for the last 20 years. They came to me and said, the hero, can you write the $1 billion check? Right? And I said, like, um, you know, what are you going to do? And they said they're going to create the fund to compete against the vision fund. But the problem is, the, my question to them is, if you guys had that fund they had 10 years ago, actually 20 years ago, how, long, how much longer you kept the Google private? And uh, he said, probably five years. You know the, how much wealth the Google created during the first five years of their, you know, the uh, public listing, and that was shared more widely among the general public, right? Because the public market has a function, a function of the uh, spreading the wealth across the other, you know, the, uh, the general public. And uh, I don't know how many of you read the, uh, the Thomas Piketty's, the, 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 the 21st year, first century capital. And uh, in his book, he proved over the last 200 years, return from investment has been always greater than retire, uh, return from the employment. So that means the uh, rich will continue to be richer. Because the other uh, people used to think like uh, when you, you know, economy grows, that the other, you know, the wage grows, wage increase will, you know, the, bridge the gap between the poor and the, you know, the rich and the poor. But in reality, what the Tomaki Piketty proved is, you know, there's always, you know, better return for the people who already have money by investing in. And the public equity market actually the fill that gap. And I always think that my, one of my job is to fill that gap because the other public pension fund provide the opportunity for the commons to participate in the other, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, fin the capital investment, right? And uh, that kind of the other, uh, the, the, uh, the big fund will actually take that opportunity out of the other uh, commons to make the other uh, benefit, the, the, the participant in wealth creation. So from that perspective, I'm not, I'm not big fan of the other uh, vision fund, but the, 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 his vision is always interesting. Cool. I think that's about it for the questions and indeed the event as a whole. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Mizuno once again for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to come and talk to us today. Um, I think, again, I speak for the, much of the audience when I say this has been a very interesting talk and uh, I've learned a lot today uh, about a wide variety of things and I hope all of you attendees have also learned a lot. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, in terms of other events we have on at the Cambridge Union, um, back to back with this event, we've got a debate on uh, intervention uh, with a number of uh, prominent guests uh, speaking. Uh, so if you're interested in intervention, so our first debate of the uh, new decade, uh, please do stick around for that. There'll be an emergency debate uh, before that on the topic of, uh, I believe it's uh, the, uh, Iran's sort of political situation at the moment. Um, so plenty of interesting stuff this evening and indeed uh, our term card for this term um, will be dropping on Monday evening. So uh, please do look out for that and uh, please do keep coming to events this term. I uh, hope you've had a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.